So good morning, everyone. And I'm just about to pull up the uh, presentation on uh, this notion of money blocks. And we have a very small audience this morning. And I was expecting this. Lots of people saying, I'm going to watch this on the playback because nobody likes talking about money. Uh, there's this whole energy around money. And especially when it comes to women and money, nobody likes talking about money. And it was really interesting last week when we started looking at goal setting and what are your financial goals when it comes to 2024. And not one person would nail their numbers to the mast to say, this is what I want to hit. These are my financial goals for 2024. So we, I'm, I'm going to stay with this and we're going to dig deep today and share with you our views. There's only three of us online here, so we can really get to grips with, you know, what are our views and what are our blocks when it comes to money? Um, it's an amazing phenomenon. And especially if you are a woman in business, the numbers are so critical and uh, it's so important we get our heads around, you know, this whole notion of money blocks. So here are some clues you might have, money blocks. And uh, the first one, you're uncomfortable discussing money. Yeah, so probably the people with the biggest money blocks are not here today because they're really uncomfortable talking about money. Um, it could be that you're undercharging and over delivering. Yeah, so it's almost thinking, always thinking, you know, am I good enough to charge this? And then almost overcompensating for a low charge. And uh, you're stressed about money, it's, uh, even though you're earning well. Yeah, so what's that stress all about? And you sabotage your success. And um, I'll give you an example of uh, somebody sabotaging their success when it comes to money. And so that could be, you know, you have a really good business, but you're sabotaging your success because you're not pulling down the funding that the business needs. Because sometimes we, you know, we think we are the business when in fact we need to take the business away from us and say, hang on, I've got to um, develop this business. I've got to nurture this business. If this business is a baby, how am I going to nurture it? Am I putting enough money in it to get it started? Am I putting enough money in there um, uh, in order to, you know, get the investment right as far as the other things the business needs over and above marketing. Uh, or it could be, you know, you could have a, this cycle of feast and famine going on. And I see a lot of women doing this. They have one order coming through. They concentrate all their time just on one that order. And they think they're rich as they're delivering that one order. And then that order comes to an end and there's not, no business there because they, they haven't invested in marketing whilst they're actually delivering that order. And it's all about this short-term fixes. So I'm gonna to come to you. I'm really interested in what, you know, clues you might have money blocks. I'm gonna tell you a funny story. One of the first um, conversations I had about money was, I was out shopping with my mother and I know I was really little because I think I was holding on to her fingers as we were walking along. And my question was her, with her was, do you ever tell daddy how much you pay for things? Yeah, because I was noticing discrepancies when I was going out shopping with her of her saying it cost this, but it really cost something else. So I was thinking, has she got a bad memory or something? You know, what's the dynamic? What's going on? So you can imagine this little face looking up and saying, you know, do you ever tell daddy what you pay for things? And my mother said, never. Yeah, that was her reply, never. And then I've, I've always been really confused about those relationships between men and women on money. Because I wonder if women are really honest with men when it comes to money, especially when they're spending money on themselves or money on things that they think perhaps the guy won't want to uh, be spending money on. 
um, the whole relationship then, if you're in business and, and you're earning money, how does that sort of pan out? Um, and it, you know, is, are you already recognizing, oh, there's a bit of childhood stuff in here. It could be that the environment I've grown up in might be causing my money blocks. My parenting might be causing these money blocks. You know, the kind of home I lived in and the school I went to might be causing money blocks. Or I might not have money blocks at all, you know, because I'm good to go as far as, you know, seeing money as something that makes money. So I'd love your feedback. So so can we come to you first, Mel, and tell us a little bit about you and money? Yeah. It's strange because I do recognize some of those things that you put up. I think um, for me, there is a lot of, um, I, you know, who am I to have lots of money? Um, why, you know, what, why should I earn loads of money or, or whatever it is? And I think some of that comes from, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, in, in the valleys, uh, the Welsh valleys with uh, my mum and dad who absolutely grafted, grafted and grafted for, for their money um, and still, you know, weren't particularly well off. Um, and so there, there's this element of I, th I think it sometimes comes from childhood and from a generational thing. Um, and I know that's very typically a, a, a Welsh, uh, a Welsh Valleys thing where, you know, you you work hard for your money. You have to work hard. Um, you have to graft. And if you don't, then, you know, you don't deserve, I suppose, in inverted commas, um, the money that you have. But I was noticing with my mum and dad, they, they they weren't poor. Um, you know, they did have a, an OK sort of financial situation um but considering the amount that they worked the time the amount of time they worked how many hours a week how hard they worked I remember thinking surely surely they should have more money than than you know if, if it was if it really was a case of what you get what you put in you get out and so I think a lot of that has stuck with me. And, and if I've thought, well, I'm not working hard enough, so why should I have all this money? Um, and I do think a, a lot of it comes from that. I definitely have, in terms of my my own, my own sort of freelance work that I do, um, I know we've discussed this, Cheryl, that it's definitely a case of um, undercharging for me. Um, I very much... How, um, you know, so far have let whoever I'm consulting for um, dictate how much they're going to pay me rather than going in and saying, well, no, I'm the courses, the training that I deliver is actually worth X amount. Um, and that's what I'd like to get. So I can recognize that. Um, I can also recognize a little bit of feast and famine in the sense that some months I'll have a lot of work coming through and then other months I don't get much at all. But then again, the, the control is not really mine. It hasn't been mine because I've been relying on those contacts, partners, associates, whatever you want to call them, um, to give me the work rather than me going out and, and getting it. And I think even if I did, I know when people have said to me, could you do a piece of work for me? Um, and how much do you charge? I, I I, pretty much kind of go silent because I think, well, I don't know. I don't know how much to charge. I don't know how much I'm worth. And then when I look at what other people, other trainers and coaches and so on are charging, I think there's that, you know, the sabotage thing and the self-doubt thing. And it's kind of, well, no, I can't possibly charge that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are linked with a lot of what you've said, actually, is, um, you know, that that's where my blockers are, definitely. And I think some of this, we can actually break the barriers down on straight away, because perhaps you've confused having a business with having a salary. 
Mm-hmm. And when you have a business, you there shouldn't be the feast or famine because if you've been in business for over a year, you will already have a pattern there of how much you're predicting versus how much you're going to pull out of the business. So it is a matter of then thinking, hang on. So say, for example, you need to turn over 50,000 or 100,000. That money goes into your account and your salary should be coming out regular. You know, it's a regular income that comes out. So there shouldn't be this feast or famine because if you're working to the numbers that you're predicting for your business, there should be no feast or famine. It's just in those scenarios when people start thinking about their business as a job and it's a salary, they almost live up to what money's in the business there and then, regardless of what might be happening next month and the month after and the month after that. So it's really interesting when we start looking at, you know, the numbers in our business, you know, are we confusing our business with a job? Do you think the business is you or is there a recognition? No, the business is a separate commodity and the business needs you to do some uh, pretty key things. And that is to predict your annual turnover and make that happen as opposed to putting the power in somebody else's hands because there are, you know, gap fillers uh, in order to then start making other sources of income happen. And it was quite interesting. I was I always learned stuff from the hairdressers. You know, my hairdresser takes forever and a day to cut my hair, uh, no matter what style it is. And he said what he doesn't understand, because he obviously runs a hairdressing business, is how many people moan about their jobs. He said people know the job they have, yeah, and they know the salary they applying for the job earning so he said why do people get a job and then moan about the money he said i run um he's in a partnership he said i'm in a partnership so he said you know at the end at the beginning of the year he agrees with the other partner what salary they're going to take out of the business and then he said if i need any more money i've got to develop side hustles in order to make that extra money come in he's so it was really interesting his idea of If you need more money, surely it's about doing more work, different work, and having different forms of income stream coming in. So, yeah, so something for you to think about then, Mel. You know, are you thinking about this business as a job as opposed to a business that you need to predict this turnover and then make it happen, yeah, and then have multiple sources of income? Because we got Karen online. And I know Karen is all into having multiple sources of income. Whenever I speak to Karen, she's got a new website for a new side hustle going on. So uh, we'll get to, to Karen after May. So May, over to you. So tell us about your relationship with money. Um, I, I don't know. It's um, When you spoke about how your parents didn't tell each other or your mom didn't tell your dad how much she was spending, that's exactly that's exactly my scenario as well. Both my parents were self-employed um, from, you know, for pretty much from graduation, really. So they're, they're both very self-made. But the things that my mom choose, chose to invest in, my dad didn't think were worth investing in most of the time, although their businesses were separate. But, you know, when it's an architect and a civil engineer, you're kind of built to argue. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I well... Now that my husband is my business partner, I try to avoid that. I try so every time I decide we invest in something, I'm sort of doing a second pitch that was already pitched to me, but it making it even better to him so that I can convince him that this is definitely worth the money. And it's been go- going well. I think we, um, you know, when you say you've got to nail down exactly how much you're going to make and all of that, it's really really difficult in the beginning. I think when we have a, a flow of like a year or two. And then we can predict what year three is going to look like. We can make, you know, calculated estimations. But right now, this is the most challenging phase of it all. You're just investing and you're hoping, you know, the ball will start rolling. You've got a strategy, but you hope. Um, so, yeah, you know, my, money is not becoming an issue now because we're still in the beginning. But I'm hoping it never becomes an issue because we, we've always got it planned. We always review it anyway. 
And it's really interesting when somebody is a startup, you know, one of the first questions they say is, you know, how much money do I need to start a business? And the problem with women versus men is that women underfund a business and a man is more inclined to, to apply for the funding the business needs to be a success. So, and women only get 1p in the pound of venture capital funding. Men are the ones that get the 99p, women get the 1p in venture capital funding. So women are applying for less capital funding as well as being successful in venture capital funding. And so it's really critical if you're starting a business, and this is, might, might sound quite scary, if you're starting a business, you need six months salary banked so that you're clear you will get paid whether you're working or not. You need six months salary and you need all your marketing costs for six months and all the capital spend covered via a drawdown, whether that's a loan or whatever that is, but you need that bank to hit the ground running heading towards those financial goals you're predicting. And I know for a lot of people, that's just too scary to pull in that money, yeah, in order to get it started. But I equate it to a car. If you buy a car and you park it outside and you never put fuel in it, it's not going anywhere. And depending on how much fuel it goes in it, depends on how far you're going to be traveling with that car, how fast you're going to be traveling with that car. So one of the problems is, you know, especially when people start up side hustles, it's because, you know, then it, it, it usually a side hustle is underfunded because you don't have the marketing available and you don't have the time in order to get the business running because you're usually doing something else. And you're almost putting so much pressure on this business in some ways to bring itself up as opposed to you being the one driving this business. I don't know how you relate to this, May, because I know in some ways, you know, you have businesses, but this is another business. So how do you relate to that? How did you cope with the start of funding? Frankly, Cheryl, if I would have waited to have six months of salary to start my business, I never would have started it. I yeah. think it's a challenging I think I think it's very very challenging nowadays, especially with inflation and you know salaries not increasing since two thousand six or something. It's really really difficult to save that much money to start a business. So I sort of jumped in head first. I I know my skills. Thank God the architecture degree gave me a lot of skills in graphic design, even video editing, so all of that. So I kind of capitalized on my own skills and saved a lot of money. Other people would have needed to spend on marketing and other things. Yeah. Um, so I think you've got to work with what you have and make the most of what you have. And you, I, I, I would disagree that you have to wait till you raise the full amount of money because then you'd always kind of say, oh, but I dipped in this month. Like I need to wait more. I need to wait more. I think start and, you know, as you go along, you can make things work with what you have. I think that's OK as long as it's just you. But if you have a workforce, Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have a workforce and you don't have money to pay them. <laughs> you know, if you were taking on offices and a workforce and committing to contracts on equipment, you know, it's having that foresight in thinking, hang on, this needs investment. Can you imagine day one, you flip the switch on the electric, day two, you can't pay for the electric. Yeah. So it's really important. That these things are sort of mapped out. Yes, we can. If, if it's only us and it is a side hustle, it's not so um, important then. But once you start, you know, making decisions on equipment, people, uh, any kind of infrastructure, then it is a matter of thinking long term. Yeah. And so it's getting away from thinking short term and then thinking long term. So uh, over to you, Karen. I know, you know, you have get involved in launching lots of business ideas what is it like for you I think for me I think it's differentiating between different businesses because I started my business in the kitchen and an awful lot of people especially women 
they're starting in the kitchen they start with what they have yeah. they start with the knowledge and the skills they've got they learn as they go along and most people just cannot afford to pay for other people to do things at the start and at the beginning um I've made a humongous amount of mistakes along the way and a lot of what I've done and what I've learned, I've learned the hard way. Um, but I was very lucky because my husband earned enough money and he could cover the bills and I just made enough money to sort of break even and keep going, but keep learning. Um, as we went on, I kind of realised that actually most of our money was coming from rental properties rather than from what I was earning. And when my husband passed away, that kind of changed how I view things because, yes, this is a bit of a side hustle, but it's also been a bit of a drain on the family and I can't allow that to happen anymore. So at the moment, we're living on the rental income and we're looking to use some of the money that we've got to buy a couple more rental properties to make sure that the bills are covered and then whatever's left over, I can use to sort of develop the business, develop myself and grow the skills to take it to the next level. I have loads of ideas and half the times that's a problem because I don't like parking them. Um, I like trying to sort of look at how I can integrate them. And one of the things I'm working with Amy at the moment is just doing a bit of an audit of my skills, my assets, um where I want the business to go so I can actually get a plan in place of next year what does it do what do I do what I, does that look like how do I help people but I've had to take a big big step back to allow that to happen part of that is is self-care anyway because I just haven't had the mental capacity um but part of it is I had skills gaps as well and things that I wanted to do, but just didn't know how to do. And I still, to a certain degree, think of my business as almost like a hobby. And I kind of need to get out of that mindset. But when it comes to money, I'm actually extraordinarily good at manifesting it. Um, I'm not sure it's always a good thing. But whenever I want it, it seems to appear. Sometimes it's the very last minute that I need it, that it appears. But I, I've been very lucky in that respect. So I, I think going forward, I just need to capitalise on that. Um, but it's also one of those things you have to be careful what you wish for, because what you wish for will turn up. And you have to use the, the positive language as well, because what you don't wish for will come up as well, just because of the way manifesting works. <laughs> so, and that's going to be it's, it's, point, isn't it? You know, we forget yeah. in all of this, uh, you know, there's two sides of it. The first side uh, you hit on earlier on in what you just said, in yeah. that um, women sometimes set up from the kitchen and they're fully enthused in the business idea and the family all jump in to all help. But once it gets to the stage, say, for example, six months, 12 months down the line, and they say to you, well, you're absorbing a lot of time in this, a lot of energy in this. Are you making money? And if you turn around to them and say, well, no, and then they realize they're paying for you to be busy and taking time away from the family, then sometimes that doesn't go down so well, does it? And they almost think, well, why are you doing this? And I also think one of the first things I learned from my first failure was that you have to have realistic expectations. And most businesses do not make money in the first year because they have to get established. You have to build up your capital. You have to build up your goodwill. You have to build up your audience. You have to know what you're doing. You have to build up the resources in the background. And that takes time. And, you know, it takes money to do that. I think with some people, this is where the market, the MLA, M stuff appeals to them because that's already done. They're picking up on someone's brand. They just have to sell it and they will make money. And for an awful lot of people, that just works and that brings in that. But you're making money for somebody else. And ultimately, what I want to do is make money for myself, but by helping people. I just still have an awful lot of a lack of clarity about what that is. And I think that's my biggest problem is that lack of clarity because 
you need to be really focused and I'm I'm sort of kind of doing this with my um course that I'm working on at the moment it, it is that when you're writing a book you need to have that clarity of what that book is about because otherwise you're going to be halfway through writing it realizing you're actually not writing the book you wanted to write you're writing for a different audience and then you've got to start again and you'll end up on this little treadmill of I'm not sure who the audience is. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Therefore, I'll just rewrite this and rewrite this. And it's having that clarity right at the beginning of what am I doing? What am I? What is my goal? What am I aiming for? What is the outcome? And yes, it'd be great to make some money. I mean, for, especially for a lot of authors, they just don't make the money to start off with because they don't have that experience. And if you look at someone like Donald Miller, he wrote Storypreneur. It's about his fourth or fifth book. But it took that fourth or fifth book to become a bestseller. And then the book that came after became an instant bestseller, um, Business Made Simple. Just because each time he wrote a book and published a book, he learned a little bit more. But if you look on IMDb for actors, it takes 10 years for them of keeping at it, keeping at it, keeping going for them to get into the really star status. If you look at Leonardo DiCaprio, he was working and jobbing, doing you know adverts and everything else as a kid until he got his big break. And it's that staying in there and keeping there and keep going and persevering and just keeping at it, building your network, building the contacts that takes them on to that next level. And, it's and it takes time and you have to have that time. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people don't have that time and they've started a business and they haven't taken into account the time it takes for that business to take off. And yes, it's okay if it's a side hustle and you've got somebody else picking up the bills, but somebody like Mel, who is a single parent, who's got two boys, you know, and a very busy life to live, there's, there almost needs to be more consideration uh, with regards to, okay, well, where is the money coming from? Where is yeah. the money coming from? Because this is not a hobby. This, uh, I might be running my business from home in order to keep the overheads low, but it does need to make money. So it's really getting our head around this whole money script. And in some ways, yeah. you know, writing a business plan is like writing a book, yeah? So it's knowing who this audience is that we're taking this business idea out to and writing the business story around how this business can be a success. I'm going to have to move on to the presentation. I have done a mini presentation. It's such an interesting topic. We can just sort of talk and talk and talk. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. I do hope the presentation is still there now. Where is my presentation <laughs> gone? Jeepers, creepers. There we go. Where's my presentation gone? Oh, how do I get my presentation back, Karen? And there we go. So where is it? Where is my presentation? I can't minimize the zoom. So where, where is my presentation gone? So I'll go into the share screen. If you minimize zoom, it goes into the top right hand corner. Share. There we are. So we're back in the presentation. So we know here are some clues around money blocks. So we've already covered these. So I want to talk about, you know, your relationship with money and, you know, Where's this come from? Where's it stem from? So we talked about, you know, the nurturing you received during your childhood, the, the whole money thing that went on between your parents, the whole money thing that went on between you and your parents, you and your friends in school, and the kind of values you were brought up with. And then it's all about the way you organize this information in your own mind. It's almost like your take on it. Okay. How do I feel about money? How is this catching up with me? Okay, so, and it's recognizing we frequently block abundance by not trusting our own power. And I think this is what uh, Karen was talking about earlier, about manifesting, recognizing we can have power over money and draw it to us. And I'm sure some of you already know the story when I was buying a house and I was in between properties and my capital was tied up and I had to raise 27,000 in seven months over and above what I was living off. And it was amazing, as Karen said, once you have that clear vision and you put power behind 
what it is you want to manifest, things happen. And logically on paper, it couldn't happen, but uh, the manifesting was absolutely amazing. And when I got the 27,000, I realized I needed to have some builders in um, before the other money clicked in. So I said, I need another 10 grand and the other 10 grand appeared. And that was all through manifesting and trusting my own power to put it out there and say every day, you know, I'm going to be abundant today and money is going to be attracted to me and money flowed in. So creating abundance can be easy, even though the ego part of us might say, oh, it's got to be hard. No, it can be easy. And, and Mel was saying this earlier on before we got on camera, you know, sometimes we know we have to think this, but there is this little nagging noise saying, oh no, you can't, oh no, you're not. Oh, no. And it is a matter of really channeling our power and seeing that we have power in our relationship with money. And perhaps you feel powerless. I can remember having a coaching call with somebody who said, oh, it's all right for you. And she started going moaning, 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 moaning. And I said, well, I've never lived a life where I've just waited for people to give me money. I've always had to know I had to make it happen. I've always had to make it happen. I've been a single parent. I've done all those things, but I've sat there and actually made money happen for me. So it's the same for you. Are you waiting around for somebody to drop that envelope through the letterbox, pick up the phone to you, or are you the one thinking, I'm going to write to them. I'm going to send them my CV. I'm going to send them my offer. I'm going to uh, um, look at how I can make money today. How, how If I had to make £100 today and my life depended upon it, I bet you could do it. And it'd be amazing how imaginative you would be to earn £100. So what if you set your, yourself just bigger goals as you went along of today, I'm going to make this amount and this is how I'm going to get it. And put your core focus on achieving that. I can remember we had a challenge in Iron Woman where we did that every day we had to earn a hundred pounds over and above what we normally did. And it's amazing, just starting by going through your bank statements. It's amazing what you're paying for. You don't even know you're paying for. And I can remember the first day thinking, how many years have I been paying this? I think it was like an insurance that somebody tagged onto a purchase of a TV. I think it was only eight pounds that you didn't notice coming out of your bank. But you think to yourself, hang on, one year, this is nearly a hundred pounds. Hang on, this has been running for five years. And when you start adding up all that money, it really gets you thinking about, I, is, am I allowing money just to flow out? as opposed to being powerful and saying, hey, I'm gonna really be a really good caretaker of, of my money. And I can remember one woman at, at an event, she came down and she said, I can completely get this now, look at the mess of my purse. And she said, I have no regard for money because look at my purse. And she said, my purse is in tatters. And she said, and my finances are in tatters, but not anymore. So it's really getting the power behind your relationship with money, you know, how are you using it? You have this relationship with it. How are you using it? But these money blocks sit in the negative subconscious beliefs and uh, they can limit your conscious desires. So you've really got to get conscious with what's going on for you around money. And the main reason it's so hard is because you have to make conscious change. And at the moment, it sits there in the subconscious, just nagging away, pulling you down. So start thinking about, you know, you, you know, how deep seated are these money blocks? You know, are they already in your body? And they're so far there that whenever you think of money, you know, your response is just to be stressful and feel as though it's dangerous. Money is dangerous. And uh, start thinking about financial stress. Are you in financial stress? Do you put yourself in financial stress and uncertainty where you don't need to be there? You know, because if you are putting yourself there, you're forever triggering this fight or flight response that will activate your nervous system. 
So, um, so start thinking about this automatic response that you have and how it's, um, you know, bringing up anxiety for you and start thinking of the ways that you can deal with these money blocks. So uh, Mel, as I said, alluded to this, just becoming more self-aware. So no matter what you're doing, being aware of what are the, what's the talk going on in my head? What is going on there? Uh, as far as I know I have to think and be a particular way, but actually, how am, am I being? How am I showing up? And you might want to start thinking about using a journal and just journal your, your day through money. What is that like? You know, people journal their way through a diet. Why not journal a way through your relationship with money? What is happening today in your life when it comes to money? And start thinking about where is that thought coming from? Is it mine? Whose is it? And uh, just becoming more and more self-aware of what's happening with the money around you. And then what's important, then start thinking about how are you sabotaging yourself when it comes to money? Are you underfunding the start of something? And then you're almost setting up your business from a poverty mentality. And because you have this poverty mindset, you usually want to sell fast and sell at a cheap price. So it is about really valuing the money your business needs and valuing how, how much money then you hold in that account for your business. And start thinking of things long term as opposed to short term. It's the start of a year, so start doing some financial planning. Think about your financial goals for the year. And if you need funding to make that happen, apply for it sooner rather than later. Because what happens is when, when, when you spiral into missing paying a bill, being in a, being in a sticky state with your business, when somebody in the bank looks at your business, you're not somebody who's fundable. So it is a matter of having that position of strength right in the beginning and planning that business. So I come from a fashion design background. I had to plan my cash flow for two years because I had to uh, order the material uh, almost like a year and a half in advance. I had to pay for people to make it up. It used to be about a year and a half before I got money in my bank account for it. So all of that needed to be funded and costed into my profit. So it is a matter of sitting down and working through the numbers for long term growth and uh, really, you know, thinking of your business as something you manage and the finances as something you manage, not that you almost like just survive with. This has got to be really well planned. Um, so, you know, you know, ask yourself the question, how are you managing the numbers? How have you put your financial targets together? for 2024 are you really convinced and have faith in that income that you're predicting coming in or do you start or do you need to start looking at other income streams to make it happen or create collaborations to make it happen or to have other um ideas around new products you've got to implement in order to hit those numbers because it's all about hitting the numbers it's not about thinking oh i'm going to fail at this because the numbers are not working here make them work whichever way you've got to make them work you know you are the conductor of this business so if you've got to bring more more uh, musicians into the orchestra do that but you've got to hit the numbers and be you know very targeted when it comes to the numbers and start thinking about the origin of your money story. Whose is it? Is it yours? Is it useful? Start thinking about the money story. Um, and as Mel said, you know, her parents felt you've got to work hard in order to feel worthy to get paid something. You know, that's ridiculous, you know, because, you know, we've moved from being, you know, a, you know, making our money in a very manual way. Now we're, you know, earning money through more of a service sector and we're earning money online. So we don't have to have this mindset of I've got to work really hard 
in order to earn money. No, you can be super clever about making money. You can invent ideas that make you money. Uh, and it's about being really creative. You know, how creative can I be and make money? How much can I actually enjoy what I'm doing and make money? And when I first started uh, being self-employed, that's what I did in my first year of, of working into, moving into consultancy. I thought, you know, what am I going to be good at? What should I do? And I decided for the first year, I was going to say yes to everything and do everything. And no, the second year, what I was good at would just show up in how much I was charging for it, how much I enjoyed it, how much, how many customers I drew to me. I was just going to say yes to everything because I had to hit the financial targets. But it was after a year, I sort of sat down and thought, hmm, you know, what, what did you enjoy doing, Cheryl? You know, where did the most money come in from? And was the most of the money coming in from stuff you enjoyed or stuff you didn't enjoy? What adaptions have you got to make? So whatever's going on for you that doesn't work, it's about breaking this pattern. And uh, Karen and I are both RTT, Rapid Transformation Therapists. We love working with people's financial beliefs around money that have been, especially when they've been programmed in there by parents who were doing things that really weren't useful or um, treating us in a way where we lost, we felt we lost our power around money. So yeah, we both love working with people and their beliefs around money. And if you feel you need to make some belief shifts connected with money, then RTT can help you as well. But I'd love to know, what have you discovered about yourself when it comes to money in this session? And what would you do differently? So I'll come to you first, Mel. So what have you learned from this morning's session? And what might you do differently? I think it's just been very useful to kind of reinforce for me what I was already sort of becoming aware of certain limiting beliefs, you know, generally, but um, particularly around money as well. Um, and kind of just in line with what you were saying about looking at you know where where the where, where does that originate from and I'm pretty sure I know it kind of originates from my parents um you know because as I said they felt that they had to graft and graft and graft and you know to to even get what they were getting um and so what I have realized is that as a result of that there's that sense of um, not just, well, you know, as I said, who am I to to have all this money, you know? And if you said, well, what, you know, what would you like to make in a year? You know, 100 grand, 200 grand. To me, initially, that would be, what, 10? <laughs> so, you know, it, but I think that awareness is there. And also there's a level of guilt, I think, as well, because when you've seen your parents work as hard as they have, you, you kind of almost think, well, I, I need to do the same because it wouldn't be fair if I just earned a shed load of money, you know, from doing something that I love and something that I enjoy. But I'm kind of dealing with those beliefs I think and I'm kind of saying well actually no it's okay it's okay to do something you love it's okay to say I want to earn a hundred grand in a year 200 grand what whatever it is I'm still slightly uncomfortable with it but I'm shifting I am sort of thinking yeah it's it's okay I know I know it feels a bit uncomfortable to say yeah you know let's let's earn half a million a year Woo you know but but why not I think that's what I'm starting now to say to myself is is why not so I think for me it's about it's continuing how I'm going so far so starting to accept those limiting beliefs understand where they come from and saying okay it's it's fine it's fine to um as you said break the pattern because that's effectively what this is all about, isn't it? And it kind of comes into, you know, the first RTT session that I've had with you. Um, 
in that, you know, my my limiting beliefs I've realized as a result of that have all been formed because somewhere along the line when I was a child, I thought or I started to believe that whatever people tell me, then that's then that has to be true. And that's not the case. So it's kind of, that's where I need to go with it. And I do want lots of money because I want to travel, Cheryl. And, you know, and I want to travel the world and I want to keep traveling and I want my boys to, to do what they want. So I'm kind of starting to get excited now about the possibility of, you know, come on, girl, don't let them tell you how much you're worth. You know how much you're worth. So, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> uh, and it's really interesting to start thinking of it like a roadmap. Yeah. Because when I was a little girl, we only went to, on holidays that was 10 miles away. We went from Bridgen, from my stick to Porth Call in a car. Yeah. And it's almost like expectations change. So if all you're planning for is to do a 10 mile journey for your annual holidays, you're going to be having a very different outlook as to how you're going to fund that holiday. And it's the same with a business, yeah? So yeah. if all you're looking to do is to go 10 miles down the road, yeah. and it's not going to cost much because you're going to stay in um, a caravan or I've got nothing against that. You know, we had a whale of a time as kids doing that. But it's a matter of thinking, hang on, how I prepare for a journey of going on my annual holidays of 10 miles is very different to if I want to go and visit Japan. Yeah, absolutely. So if yeah. I'm going to want to visit Japan and my business funds this holiday of me going to Japan, yeah, I've got to really up how much money I'm going to be earning via this business. You know, mm. your outlook is different, yeah? Mm. Uh, and it's almost like your body takes on a different feeling as well. You know, planning mm. a holiday say where all you've got to do is raise a couple of hundred pounds yeah. versus planning a holiday where it's going to be around about sort of could be 10,000 pounds. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the shift is quite different and quite significant. And it it's is, a matter yeah. of you just be spending all your life looking just to raise, you know, a few hundred pounds to go on holiday or because mm -hmm. travel is what motivates you. You're going to say, no, I'm going to put those goals together where I believe Japan is possible next year or going on a safari is possible. And sometimes we do need to have that, whatever it takes to fire us up, to say, come on, let's get this sorted. I yeah. know I've got to make bigger numbers. Let's make bigger numbers work. And yeah. then sit down with pen and pad and start thinking, how do I make the bigger numbers work? Because it's only numbers, yeah? It's only bigger numbers that gets the bigger holiday. So why not create the bigger numbers in your business? Mm. And it's all for you. Yeah. It's yeah. All for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just to say very quickly, because that you've just made, I, I've just made a sort of connection in my head now. I remember when I went backpacking around Australia and I'll never forget my dad, bless him, said to me, what do you want to do that for? What do you want to go to Australia for? And my answer was, and I don't know where it came from, I just said, well, why not? Yeah. Why wouldn't I want to go to Australia? Yeah. And so this is like, yeah, I need to be saying exactly this about money as well. Yeah, and it's your roadmap. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to yeah. go bigger places? Create bigger numbers, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we'll sit together and we'll work up some bigger numbers for you, Mel. Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> Over to you, May. What have you got out of this session, and how we? What are you going to put into action? Um, I think it's made me a bit more aware of. Um, I definitely need to improve my planning. <laughs> I definitely need to go back and write down because, you know, when I started this business, I wrote down an Excel sheet of exactly what I'm planning to spend but once you start the business you discover oh actually I need that too I need that too and with AI coming out and me doing all the legwork AI is definitely an investment I have to make so when new things come out new costs come in but I haven't been updating the Excel sheet <laughs> because mainly because I don't want to see how much I'm spending because the number is going to scare me <laughs> um 
especially that it's still in the beginning so there isn't much revenue but um I definitely need to do that and I need to face you know even if it's a scary thought I need to sit down and do it because it's a business and I need to keep planning and also when you were talking about how much you're worth and self-sabotage and all these things I I tend to go soft when people ask for like a lower pi- price or something because because I'm working it like I'm connecting people to, to good healthcare. So it's kind of, I always feel that guilt of like, you know, healthcare should be free, but no, this is, this is private healthcare. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be beating myself up for charging people because I'm, I'm doing work and the work is, has a value and, um, and I need to, you know, stick to that value because, you know, I, I'm doing work. Um, and these are the two things that I think I came out of. Don't self-sabotage and plan things better oh wonderful and also may probably that'll impact on you as well is because you're doing your own marketing because you're doing so much of it yourself building a website you know using ai to create probably text images because you're doing all this if you had to pay somebody else that has a value yeah So it's remembering how much value you've added to the business that day. We talked about making a hundred pounds. Sometimes it's a great motivator for you to think, hang on, I've done this for the business today and it has a value, yeah? Because that value equates to the time you've put into it as well. And probably a lot of software licenses you've had to purchase. So these things can't get hidden, yeah? Especially if you're in a partnership with somebody else, you can say to them, I put this amount of value into the business today. Yeah. Or I've saved the business this amount today because I've done it. And this is what the and then is thinking just because you're doing it, don't then devalue what you've done and maximize upon it when you're putting it out through the social media feeds. Yeah. So make sure there is a return on all that hard work you've put into it as well. Monetize that effort. As I say, you know, you're in a partnership. Tell the partner what you've done, yeah? You can say, yeah, you're cooking dinner. Yeah, this is what I've done today. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, May. Over to you, Karen. What have you learned and how would you put it into action? I think um, I sort of kind of had a realisation that I'm, I don't really trust myself with money, so I need to sort of work on that, um, look at where it came from, why it came from, and how I deal with it. But... Um, I had a sort of why not moment decades ago. And it's actually one of the most powerful questions you can ask yourself. Why not? And it is kind of like, there's a journal in this one. Um, simply because it, when you ask the question, why not? And you get the answers back, you also start to get to solutions as well. And that really empowers you more than anything else. So sometimes it's just a case of asking, why not? Why can't I do this? What do I need to put in place? What actions do I need to take? What goals do I need to create? And then just take action. And it's that whole taking action bit that is just so important. Well, thank you for all your input this morning. I've really loved talking about money blocks. And even though it's something we don't like talking about, when we start talking about it, we can't stop talking about it. I'm sure there's going to be lots of actions we're going to be, uh, you know, putting into place throughout the whole week ahead. I think I'm going to do like a bank statement review again. I I was amazed how much I saved doing a bank statement review and everyone can do it. So uh, next week we have the lovely Lisa Reese joining us, who's going to be taking us through that practical how to build your email list by putting in place your sales funnel and um, putting in place any kind of lead magnets that you want to attract people onto your website to download. So there's so many changes going on with what you can do and what you can't do when it comes to all the uh, email um, providers. So she's gonna come on and do a really practical, this is how to, now put together your email list and how to get your sales funnel working. So it's a massive topic. She's such an expert at it. And so be prepared, come along with a bit of paper. You'll get the recording anyway, but you're gonna learn tons of stuff because you know your network is your net worth and your net worth sits in that email list. 
So if you're not working on your email list today and every other day, you're losing money. In fact, you're hemorrhaging money if you're not building your email list. So we're going to help you to build that email list and start seeing that dripping tap of business coming into your business in a very automated way. So join, join us next week at 11 o'clock for Lisa Reese, where we're going to be looking at sales funnels. Have a fantastic week ahead and see you soon. Okay, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Bye. Bye.